Uh, we're going to be in Genesis this morning, Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5, and we're going to be reading the entire chapter this morning. It's a genealogy, mostly, uh, and uh, my recommendation whenever you're reading a genealogy out loud is just to say whatever comes to mind and do it boldly, and no one will think twice about it. So um, I'm just going to read through these names, and whatever comes will come <laughs> as, as we go through it. All right, Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days that Adam had lived were 930 years, and he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he had fathered Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enosh lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahalalel. Kenan lived after he fathered Mahalalel 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. When Mahalalel had lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahalalel lived after he fathered Jared 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. And when Jared had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Hmm. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah had lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground of the Lord is cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. This is the word of the Lord, and we are grateful for this word. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, correction, reproof, and training in righteousness. Let's go to the Lord again in prayer. Um, and ask him to speak to us by his spirit through his word. Lord, we need you to understand. Lord, we can maybe get some cognitive understanding of this text, but we need you to, Lord, open our eyes to the beauty of who you are, to the truths that will transform our lives from this text. Lord, would you, by your spirit, please come and please move through this word in our hearts so that we might be shaped by it. Lord, so that our, our lives... Can, can reflect what it's calling us to. Uh, we, we, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. There's a Latin phrase, memento mori, which is translated, remember death. I'm sure as you read through Genesis 5 with me, uh, you saw the repeated cycle, right? It was, uh, there's a lot of repetition going on. Someone lives for X amount of years, fathers someone else, lives for another X amount of years, has more sons and daughters, completes his years, and dies. And he died. And he died. 
and he died. It's, it's especially significant here in Genesis 5 because we know what came before this, right? We know that this is the great consequence of Adam and Eve's failure in the garden. For in the day you eat of it, you will surely die, the Lord said to Adam and to Eve. And they did take of the fruit, and they did die in the sense that it was an inevitable death. They were barred now from the tree of life. They were separated from the presence of God, the very giver of life. And so now death comes unexpectedly. That's the powerful line at the beginning and end of the famous sermon preached by the actor Carl Malden in the Disney classic Pollyanna. Death comes unexpectedly. It's a hilarious scene in the movie of a fire and brimstone sermon that makes the congregation squirm. Obviously, it's a bit of a parody, but the squeamishness of the congregation in the face of a sermon about death and hell taps into something true about us. We don't want to hear about death. We don't want to talk about death. We don't want to remember death. That seems a bit morbid. I mean, for some of you, maybe death is vague and distant. Maybe you've never been affected by it too intensely, and you'd like to keep it that way. There's more important matters to attend to, like the daily stuff of life and family and money and recreation and fun and mission and retirement. There's no time to consider death. Maybe for some of you, death is painful and raw. The death of loved ones has completely rearranged your life, your story, even your emotional well-being. You've been wounded deeply by the sting of death. It can be tempting to grow hardened to it, to stuff the thought of death in a box and keep it locked up lest the emotional wound get reopened. It hurts too much to go there. Maybe for some of you, you don't like to think about death, but you can't help it. Death is a fear that pervades your life. You're afraid of growing old. You're afraid of getting sick. You're afraid of what could happen and of all the ways it could happen. So death is lurking and you're committed to outsmart it. It it does seem a bit strange and morbid to consider our death, but this is exactly what so many in church history have encouraged us to do. There's an old book called The Rule of St. Benedict, and in that he says, One of his aims is to desire eternal life with all the passion of the Spirit and to keep death daily before one's eyes. That was his one of his rules for life. Keep death daily before one's eyes. Jonathan Edwards had resolutions that he wrote down, and he said this, resolved to think much on all occasions of my own dying and of the common circumstances which attend death. To think often of my own death. Why? (laughs) Why should we think often of death? Why is this reality of death that we know it's there, and he died, and he died, and he died, we know it's coming, but why do we need to think much about it? Why can't we just gloss over it until we have to? What's the wisdom in considering our death daily? Well, here's, here's why I'm going to give three. I actually only have two points this morning, but each has three sub points. So it's, it's really like eight points. All right. Um, but why should we often, th- this is the reality of death that we're talking about here. And why should we think often of our death? Well, first of all, because our fate is certain. This is going to happen. Like, all the things we think about that could possibly happen, this one is one, it's going to happen, (laughs) right? So we need to consider this. This is the obvious reality that's emphasized in the text. It, It wasn't originally like this. There was a tree of life. 
There was access to the giver of life in the garden. And yet now it's gone through sin and death now reigns. Psalm 90 verse 9 through 10 says, For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70 and even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Romans 5 tells us the bad news that resulted from Adam's sin. And just pulling out the bad news lines, because it's interspersed with some good news lines, but just, just for right now, the bad news lines of those verses, it says, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. Because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Death reigns. Death has an incredible track record. I mean, the mythological Grim Reaper is really good at his job. We should think about death because our fate in death is certain. With one caveat, right? Because all of you are thinking, oh yeah, Ben? Well, Jesus could come back. <laughs> you were thinking it, Randy. <laughs> okay. True. All right. Jesus could come back. <laughs> this, is a, this is gloriously true. The return of Jesus is imminent and it could take place at any point. And you should long for it and you should pray for it. You should ask him to come quickly, Lord Jesus. But do not plan and live your life with the presumption that it will happen in your lifetime. No one knows the day or the hour. And so the assumption that we will die is a really good one. Especially when considering a God who a thousand years is as a day for him. So this reality of our death is a very certain thing unless Jesus should return. But we can assume that we will die. Secondly, our fate is certain. Why else should we consider our death? Because our lives are small. Our lives are small. It, it's gonna, this sermon is going to get way more joyful later, but I'm sorry. We've got, we got to go here first. Our lives are small. We don't like to think about this because we like to think we're important. We like to think we're big, influential, significant. We like to think that we are somebody, right? And that we're achieving something and that, we're, that we, we, we have something to bring. But if you just, if you just think about your life, and how short it is and how small it is. I mean, this is what Isaiah talks about, right? A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. And all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. Grass. The grass withers. The flower fades but the word of our God will stand forever. We fade. We wither. We're small. Have you ever felt the weight of the insignificance of your life? I'm talking here in light of human measures that we concoct to determine these kinds of things. Money, power, influence, etc. These things are what get people in the history books, right? Right? But even those influential people, whether good or evil, are dead and gone. Do you know how many famous and intensely significant people there are in the world that you have never heard of? Ecclesiastes 2.11 gets at this. Listen to this verse, Ecclesiastes 2.11. He says, Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had spent in doing it, and again, all was vanity and a chasing after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. That's the Ecclesiastes man, the author, thinking, what is going on here? What is this all for? It just, it just comes and goes. And there's a psychologist uh, by the name of Jonathan Haidt who says, the author of Ecclesiastes wasn't just battling the fear of meaninglessness, he was battling the disappointment of success. 
He had accomplished things. He had done things. He had what he thought was significance. And then he looks back on his life. And how many people have you heard who thought they were really important, really influential, really significant, and they look back on their life and all they can think is, I'm going to die. And I'm going to be gone. And it's all, what was it all for? There's a, a great song, I've probably mentioned it before, but uh, Bruce Cockburn, uh, a well-known artist, musician, he wrote a, a song called Pacing the Cage. He says, I never knew what you all wanted, so I gave you everything, all that I could pillage, all the spells that I could sing. But it's as if the thing were written in the constitution of the age. Sooner or later, you'll wind up pacing the cage. The fact is, it's a little unnerving to stop and think about just how small we are. The rulers of kingdoms and nations, the richest of the rich, the influencers, the activists, the scientists, the famous and renowned, they all become a paragraph, maybe, in a history book. Most of everyone who lives is simply here and gone to be completely forgotten in the time span of a couple generations even. I mean, if you even just think about I mean, how often in your daily life does the accomplishments of Alexander the Great matter to you? I mean, we study them. But how often do you think, I mean, that he was the most powerful man in the entire world at the time. And yet he's just a blip in a history book for your little kindergartner to learn a song about. Because our lives are small. Last sad point. Our time on earth is short. Our fate is certain. Our lives are small. And our time is short. Psalm 39. O Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Why does the psalmist pray that? He prays, Lord, let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths, and my lifetime is nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. (sighs) Breath. There's a Calvin and Hobbes strip that um, a raccoon is discovered by Calvin, and the raccoon dies. And Calvin says, this is where Dad buried the little raccoon. I didn't even know he existed a few days ago, and now he's gone forever. It's like I found him for no reason. I had to say goodbye as soon as I said hello. Still, in a sad, awful, terrible way, I'm happy I met him. And then as they walk off in the distance, Calvin says, what a stupid world. Is that, is that all this is? <laughs> is this just a stupid world? Is this just a world of meaninglessness? A world where death reigns? We come and go, and the cycle of life continues on. Someone is born, they parent a child, they live longer, they die, their children continue on, parent children, and then they die, and so on and so forth. Is that, is that what this is? Is it just the circle of life? I mean, you read Genesis 5, and you almost anticipate that's what it is. And he died. And he died. But there's some clues in the text that this is not all there is. That yes, we should remember our death because it's true. Our fate is certain and our lives are small and our time is short. But that doesn't mean there's not something really big going on. That doesn't mean that we're not a part of something that is way bigger than our small little selves. There's some clues in the text. Let's see what they are. 
So whenever you're reading a genealogy, you're always looking for the repetitions, right? But then you also want to notice, oh, wait, that was strange. That broke the repetition. That didn't follow the line. That didn't follow the pattern. There's a contrast here. And where do we meet the contrast? We see at the beginning of the text that it's continuing on. The image of God is continuing to move on, right? Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. They have Seth, and he's after their likeness, and the, and the image of God is continuing. The male and female reality is continuing. The, the image bearing is continuing. The, all of this is going on, and yet there's something in the fathering and he died uh, repetition that is broken, and that's when we meet the man Enoch. What's it say? Look at verse, oh, there it is, 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. That's a little different than, and he died. <laughs> So what's going on with Enoch? In, a, in this genealogy, there are ten names. In a genealogy to follow in chapter 10, there are ten names. When you get to a genealogy of David and Ruth, there are ten names. The, 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 the names are chosen for an intentional purpose, and they're placed in places for an intentional purpose, a theological one. And so what's interesting about Enoch is that he breaks the refrain and he died and he's the seventh in the line. He's the seventh name listed. And if you do any Bible study in the Old Testament, you'll start to realize that seven's a significant number. We just heard Lamech boast that he's going to um, be worse than Cain, 70-fold. Lamech, in the end of this genealogy, lives 777 years that's a parallel to the previous genealogy, right? Like there's a lot, of, a lot of symbolism and comparison and contrast with the previous genealogy. But I want us to see what's going on with this guy. <laughs> what's going on with Enoch? He gets some commentary on his life and what we hear is that he was not. So, so the question that we're asking is, how did he get out of death? How did he, how did he escape the reigning power of death? And apparently, walking with God is the way out of death and into life. Walking with God is the way out of death and into life. And so that's going to bring up three questions for us. First of all, what is walking with God, right? Secondly, can we walk with God? And thirdly, will we then escape death? if we can, right? Because don't, don't you want to know what Enoch somehow got access to, <laughs> right? Because we're like, eh, we already talked about how the Bible's very clear, we're going to die, but wait a second, Enoch somehow in walking with God got out of death and into life. So what do we see? First of all, what is walking with God? What is walking with God? First of all, walking with God, we see requires righteousness. Why do I say that? Keep reading. Go to, go to chapter 6, verse 9, because we're going to meet another guy who is the only other guy in the Bible who's specifically said to walk with God. His name is Noah. Look at verse 9, chapter 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. So you see the connection? We get some clues as to what walking with God means in that text. Walking with God implies righteousness and blamelessness. And Noah was a righteous and a blameless man. He walked with God. Walking with God is going to require righteousness. And when the Bible mentions walking with God, it's referring to righteous people who are exercising trust in God and faithfulness to him. All right, righteousness in the Old Testament, they're trusting in God and they're being faithful to him and to his commands. Je uh, Abraham's a great example of this. Abraham's the next big patriarch in the line of the Bible, and he becomes the actual quintessential picture of this, right? Because it says in Genesis 15, 6, and he believed the Lord 
and it was counted to him as righteousness. Enoch walked with God. Noah is a righteous man who walks with God. Abraham, the next big patriarch in the line, he believes God, and it's counted to him as righteousness. What does that mean for Abraham? Does that mean he walked with God? Help us out, the apostle James. That's right. James chapter 2 says this. You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works, and the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Abraham believed in God, it was credited to him as righteousness, and so he is considered God's friend. He's walking with God. He is close to God. He's drawn near to God because he's righteous. How did he get the righteousness? Because he believed in God. He trusted in God. And so if walking with God requires righteousness, and righteousness is made possible by faith, then walking with God requires faith. And in fact, this is the very point that the author of Hebrews makes about Enoch. So see, I just did a circle. We're coming back. Okay, faith and Enoch. How am I going to... I just did, we did Enoch to Noah, righteousness. We followed that line to Abraham who believes in God. It's credited to him as righteousness. So righteousness must be by faith. And then, then we're, now we're coming back to Enoch. How is faith and Enoch connected? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, it says, By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So, so when we're trying to figure out what's going on in Genesis 5, the New Testament actually gives us a lot of help to come back to that and say, what is this walking with God and how is it that Enoch was able to escape death? Well, Enoch, by walking with God, meant that he was a man of faith and in that faith was seen to be a righteous man and because of that faith and that righteousness, the Lord, in his sovereign grace, says, you know what? You're not going to face death. And he pulls them from death and brings them into life. And that's going to become a picture for everyone of us who puts our faith in Jesus Christ. Because to put it in New Testament language, to walk with God is to, here's my definition of walking with God. It is to trust his promises, obey his precepts, and enjoy his presence. To walk with God is to trust his promises, obey his precepts, and enjoy his presence. Or to, to just quote the Bible language, it's we walk by faith, we walk in love, and we fellowship with God. We walk by faith, we walk in love, and we fellowship with God. That's what walking with God is. Don't, do, do, does your heart long to walk with God? To be a friend of God? To draw near to God? Does your heart long to know God? How? What does that look like? It looks like you trusting in his promises and obeying his commands. Remember Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And it means enjoying his presence that he gives us by his spirit. So here's the question. That's what walking with God is. Here's the second question. Can we walk with God? Is that possible? It's a no and a yes. But before it's a yes, it's a no. <laughs> okay? Like, we, here, here's what we're, we're going to get into. No, no one, no one can walk with God. You and I can't be righteous. 
Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Israel, they were chosen by God for a particular purpose and it had nothing to do with them, but had everything to do with God's electing grace. Noah after the flood. Remember, when, look in the text. When Noah's born, Lamech is saying, hey, this son of mine, out of the ground the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech is saying, Noah, the, the man whose name means rest, he's going to bring the rest and the comfort of being, of being free from this curse, right? And so then the flood happens, and Noah's coming out, and he's worshiping God, and he's got a covenant with God, and Noah's like a new Adam, He's like a second Adam figure, right? He's the man who's going to now represent the world. And guess what? He goes into a garden, takes of the fruit of the vine, and gets drunk. And who knows what else goes on. But the point is, is that, Ab- that Noah fails in a garden just like Adam does. And that hope of him being the one to answer the curse is unfulfilled. And then Israel's called out. And maybe they can be the ones that are a light to the nations. But Israel fails. Everyone keeps failing. Every human keeps failing to walk with God. Abraham, if it wasn't for God's electing grace, he would have continued to be an idol maker and an idol worshiper had God not patiently pursued him. Israel, with all their good intentions, constantly failed to be the people that God asked them to be. And Paul is quite clear in Romans 3.10 that no one is righteous, no, not one. So to come back to the language of walking, it's not possible for us to walk with God because we walk in darkness. And the darkness wants nothing to do with the light. So no, we, we can't try hard enough to get into God's presence. It's not possible. The deeper problem is that you and I don't want to walk with God. We're doing everything we can to be clear from his holy presence. We don't want to be close to God, but here's the great good news. God, with immeasurable grace, comes to us. We are running away from him. We are setting ourselves up as his enemy. Our desires are wholly against him. And yet even while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ comes to us. He draws near to us. He pursues us as we were running from him and didn't want anything to do with him and we're living in the darkness and following the course of this world. We were, uh, we were enemies dead in our trespasses and sins and he comes to us. Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, walks among us. The true and only perfect righteous one comes and dies Jesus Christ, the righteous one, dies in our place, and that's not how it's supposed to work, right? It's the righteous that are supposed to get life and the sinners that are supposed to get death. That's how it works. But Jesus, full of mercy and rich in love, dies in our place so that now by faith, Believing in his death and resurrection, we can be counted as righteous just like Abraham and just like Enoch. Now by faith, we can please God. Now by faith in Jesus, we are righteous, which means we can be those who walk with God. It's something made possible through Jesus Christ, the only righteous one who came to defeat death for us. And so, in light of the gospel, the answer to the question of can I walk with God is a huge, resounding yes. You can. You and I can walk with God. We can trust his promises. We can obey his commands. And we can enjoy his presence. Walking with God doesn't mean that we have to go about our lives like monks and nuns, always somber and serious. Nor does it mean we're always quoting verses and singing songs and being really spiritual. And he walks with me and he talks with me. 
how are you doing today? Oh, just walking with God like I do. No, that's, that's not what this is about. Walking with God is the daily experience of being a righteous people who believe in Jesus, obey Jesus, and enjoy the presence of Jesus. It's, it's the fact that we are righteous now in Christ. So we can obey him. We can enjoy him. We can fellowship with him because our faith is in him. And so now with that faith, we can please God just as Enoch did. And so the last question, does that mean we get to escape death? If we can walk with God and be righteous in Christ, does that mean we, like Enoch, get to escape death? And the answer is no and yes. The no part of that answer is that we will physically die. It's important to remember that our fate And our smallness and life's brevity still is a reality. It's not completely done away with yet. And so we still should, like the psalmist, say, Lord, help me to know how fleeting I am. Help me to keep the humility that recognizes that you are God, I am not. In comparison to your glory, I am small and insignificant. We still carry a sense of the reality of death. Death still hurts. It still wounds. It still leaves a mark. It's not how it's supposed to be. It's the result of sin, and we hate it. But because we're small and life is short, that doesn't mean that life is insignificant. Because even now, we are laying up treasures in heaven. Right now, we are walking in the light and death does not get the last word. Right now, the reality of death only propels us to mission of proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom because that's an eternal reality that death can't defeat, that death can't get in the way of, death can't stop from happening because death's already defeated. Jesus Christ has defeated death. So the coming eternal new heaven and new earth is what gives us incredible significance now because right now we have a message to proclaim and that is you're going to die but you don't have to let death be the last word. Jesus Christ has come so that life can reign, not death. Jesus Christ has come so that new life can happen and you don't have to remain dead in your trespasses and sins. You can walk with God by faith in Jesus. That's why we go out. That's why we proclaim. That's why we, One Savior Church, need to keep death on our minds daily because we are talking to people and we are loving people and we are working with people who might not know that Jesus Christ is the only way to life. We go out and proclaim what John 8, 12 says, that Jesus is the light of the world. Whoever follows him will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. There is a way to escape death, and it's by faith in Jesus. And even though we as Christians will crumble outwardly and our physical selves are wasting away, we are being renewed inwardly day by day, and we will live with resurrected bodies for all eternity. So yes, we do escape death. Death is defeated. It wounds presently, but its terror is no more. One day, all death will cease forever. And we need to remember that text, or we need to remember this truth, and so I want you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 2. Because here's the thing. By faith, 
we are made righteous. By faith, we can now please God. By faith, we can walk with God. And what is the promise that he has made to us that we believe by faith? right? Walking by faith is, we have to walk by faith because we can't see the promises fulfilled yet. And that's, this is why, this is called the foolishness of the gospel. This is why the world thinks we're crazy. (laughs) This is why the world looks at us and be like, are you kidding me? You're saying, you're preaching that death is defeated? What about the death that is surrounding us everywhere? What about the death that just happened in my own home? What about the death that's happening with my friends? What about the death that's happening in war-torn nations? What about the death that is happening in the impoverished places all over this world? What do you mean death is defeated? And this is where as followers of Jesus, this is what it means to walk by faith. To walk this faith that we trust in his promises, that he will come and set it all right. And this has been the faith of the people of God through all this story. That God is faithful to his promises. Here's Isaiah chapter 2. This is why this is so important. And 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 I'm, I'm bringing it here specifically because right now, if you're watching your news feeds, war is on everyone's minds. So what does the Bible say about our hope, about the reigning realities of death that seems like it's always there? How how do we as followers of Jesus Christ walk by faith in that? Isaiah 2, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations. He shall decide disputes for many peoples. (laughs) Jesus is going to be the the perfect foreign policy dude, right? Like he's going to know he gets to decide. He's ruling over all nations and he decides the disputes now. He sets things right now. And it says they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and nation shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they learn war anymore you see the hope of our lives is that Jesus is going to come and he's going to get rid of all this nation stuff and he's going to say I'm the king of the world everyone every knee shall bow and testify to the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord that's where it's all going that's what where it's all headed and so the question is okay and in light of that hope in light of that truth in light of the fact that Jesus will win he will end death he will end war what do we do now verse 5 oh house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. What do we do now? We walk with God. We trust his promises. We obey his commands to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. And we enjoy his presence now because the Holy Spirit, the agent of that new world, has come to us now. The the message this morning is to encourage you to see that you can, if you believe by faith in Jesus, you can walk with God. And so it's not morbid to keep death daily on your minds. What it becomes for us is a reminder that our significance, that our story, that our, the good of our lives, it's all bound up in this great big story that we get to be a part of. We are small, but Jesus is not. He's glorious. Our lives are short, but Jesus is eternal, and we're united to him. 
Our fate is certain and death will come, but it doesn't get the last word. And so Paul can say, oh death, you are swallowed up in victory. You no longer have a sting because life reigns in the true and better Adam that we sang about, Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Would you just, in your own heart, assess, do, do, I, do I want to walk with God? If you're, if you're a believer in Jesus, it's possible to trust in him and to obey him now and to enjoy his presence. Is that, that's where the light is. That's where the Lord is. Are you sensing a desire to walk with him by faith? in love, fellowshipping with him. That's, that's the way. And it's made possible through Jesus. Would you give him thanks right now? And would you also maybe assess where you've lost a vision for the intimacy that you can have with Jesus Christ? Lord, Thank you for coming for us. Thank you for your pursuing grace. Thank you that even while we were still sinners, you died for us. Lord, that we can know life in Christ, that we can know eternal life. Lord, thank you. Help us to be a people who are truly a righteous people. Lord, righteous in you and then living out of that righteous status with lives that are full of righteous deeds and full of goodness and full of the glory of God in our lives, that we would do everything we do to your glory and we would make it our aim to please you in all things because we're walking with you. Thank you that we can have this life, real, true life, and that you walk with us. It is so good to be your people. We give you praise, and it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Would you stand with us? If this is what you believe, if you are a baptized believer in Jesus Christ, then you are welcome to this table. And what this table is, is, a, is an opportunity to give thanks. It's, it's, a, it's a physical act that remembers this blood that was shed for me and this body that was broken for me is my pathway to life. And so come to give thanks. Come to worship Jesus Christ and to have a physical reminder of the life that he brings his people who trust in him.